for the opportunity to <laughs> thank you for the opportunity uh, to present today. And I am delighted that we will have this as a resource in the event that there are students and alum who may not have had the opportunity to view it. I definitely want interaction and questions. And so please do let me know if you have questions. I'm not able to see the chat. So you're going to have to say Kimberly or KET uh, because Kimberly Ellison Taylor sometimes is a mouthful. So what we're going to talk about is exactly what Allison said, the business case for inclusive leadership. And we're going to use my own experiences as a business case, because I do think as leaders throughout whatever industry you're in around the world, it is important to understand that in addition to technology, that we also need to understand all of the people implications. Throughout my career, and I am Generation X, so that'll give you uh, some kind of timeline on where I fit in the generational perspective. I have actually thought about the people, the processes, and the technology. But okay, as I've worked in different arenas, I've realized that it has always come back to the people. So yes, in my day-to-day -day role, I could talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning, the internet of things, blockchain, cybersecurity, big data, robotics process automation. We can talk about any number of technologies that are here and also that will be continuing to evolve. But what does any of that matter if you don't galvanize, mobilize, and inspire the team to achieve the greatest benefits. Now, I'm going to tell you, and this is just certainly my view, but if your people have not the skill sets, it's just not going to work. I don't care how amazing your technology is. There is no substitute for having people who feel motivated, bought into the vision, and understand where you're going. And so that's why you see the team listed. That's why you see the puzzle piece. Ideally, everyone on the team would know where they fit. Everyone would understand the value and the contributions they bring to the team. They would also understand that even if they're different, like the M in this case, that they their contributions would be just as valued and that they would have a sense of belonging and able to co contribute in a meaningful way. Now, we've been saying that for years. There's no surprise. There are leading management gurus have, who have talked about the value of the team. And I get it. You're brilliant. I mean, I just think, you know, we have the best programs. We have the best students, the highest caliber faculty members anywhere, everywhere. I think that's absolutely true. But I also know that we need reminders. We need to be reminded that even in a pandemic environment, that the team is still important, that people are critical. Yes, we are developing and working on technologies that will benefit people around the world, especially in various industries. But what does that matter when we have the perfect storm? And let me talk about what that is. So where are we today? Our new normal is definitely who, who would have ever have thought we would have been in an environment where money isn't necessarily cash, isn't preferred. As a matter of fact, I've been in a lot of retail stores where they prefer to have credit cards. They want contactless online e-commerce everywhere as much as they can. We also have an environment where we've moved our physical on-premise work environments into our living rooms and to our kitchens and to the spare bedroom. I mean, we've cleaned out storage rooms for our now home office. And in many cases, it's because we're hiding from our kids, because we're homeschooling. And I can't tell you how many of my colleagues and friends have said, Whew, I hope my, my, my kids are going to get new teachers next year because that last one wasn't great. They were talking about themselves. It just, this whole environment took us in places that we never thought we'd be in before. 
but it also has tested us and challenged us to ensure that we're checking on each other, that we're looking out for how to mobil mobilize the team to do some pretty phenomenal things in the cases that I've heard, but also just to keep the lights on. And, and we're struggling in order to do that. So what's helping to cause this? Well, it's just the pace of change. So in the industries that I have spoken with, I will tell you that we have constantly said from an Oracle perspective, the pace of change is never as slow as it is today. I can tell you in the accounting profession, we have absolutely say, said that as well. Leaders look around corners, anticipate what might be over the horizon. I have personally said that we can't wait until it rains to build the ark. But in order to start building the ark, you have to share the vision, the outcome, the purpose, the why. Because otherwise, you're going to get a hundred times while you're working on your transformational project to do better digital engagement, to do better, more proactive supply chains, to improve your relationships from a multinational perspective. If the team does not understand why, what, when, and what's in it for me, you are going to get basically are we there yet? What are we doing? Why are we doing this? And in some cases, you might get people who drag their feet. That's just the reality of being a leader in environments. And we know this all too well. We all have examples. But the stakes are high. We are in an environment where technology is an equalizer. Technology level sets the playing field. And just when people think they're going to feel comfortable and they've got it under control, in case those iconic case studies weren't enough for them. And certainly we know what they are. We study them in school. We study disruptors. We know what Uber did to the taxi cab industry. We know about Airbnb and what happened in the, that particular case with hotels. We study Kodak. We know what happened with Blockbuster. We know what happened with Netflix. Unfortunately, we see this playing out around the country. And in most cases where there was so little margin, it just wasn't enough. The pandemic just pushed them right over the edge into filing for bankruptcy or closing stores. Technology is definitely an enabler, a strategic advantage when used well. It is an enabler of moving into areas you never even considered. It generates new ideas when applied appropriately and leverage with the team members, you can accomplish more and better things. Technology in and of itself will not achieve the greatest benefits unless we add that people component. And there's always going to be a people component. And so our competitors are not just from Pittsburgh or North Oakland in particular. They're, they're going to be from all over the world. And so technology, and, and I remember saying this when I was in Beijing or Hong Kong just last year in particular, and I said, it's interesting that I flew here, but technology means I'm really only one click away. And I think that we have to remember that with great power comes great responsibility. And there's definitely some ethical concerns and people concerns as it relates to leveraging technology in a responsible way. So what do we do? We got to get everybody involved. Inclusive leadership means everyone. I on purpose don't say diversity as much as I say inclusion. And I say that because diversity just means, oh, we're just gonna get a bunch of people together who are different. We're gonna check the box. Yes, we did it. We got the female. Oh, we needed an African-American and a black person, especially in the, the racial tension and environment that we have going on. Oh, okay. So what other underrepresented minorities? Ah, we, we need someone who's Hispanic. Okay, we need someone who's Indian. We need someone who's Asian. Huh, we all. Oh. We need someone who has a physical disability. We need someone of a different orientation. Now, yes, we need everyone. We need everyone. Caucasian men, we need you. Women, we need you. Ethnicity, religion, we need you. If I didn't name your group, know that when I say inclusion, it's you too. 
And that is because we are in an environment where the best ambassadors, the best catalysts for change are coming from uncommon places. And that's why we need everyone because people have different vantage points. They see things differently. We know customer expectations are changing. Technology is an enabler to hopefully overcome fear, uncertainty, and doubt, because that's the reality of working in a competitive environment, because there's definitely going to be all three of those things. And so we need people to be a microcosm of the customer base and a microcosm of the world that we are operating in. And so that's why you see everyone working together. Now, for the business case. I know this works because it worked in my case. I grew up in the inner city of Baltimore. Now, am I acutely aware that there is unconscious bias? Yes. And am I aware that in more recent years and certainly over the last few months, we have actually been, as a nation, more candid, more courageous, talking about racism. Now, what's odd for me, and it's a little uncomfortable, it's like kind of making my skin crawl a little bit because we've never been this candid. We've, we've never talked about racism this overtly, at least in the lifetime that I can remember in my 50 years. We just didn't. And yes, I am 50. But no, we just didn't talk about it the way we're talking about it now. It, it feels like saying Voldemort, thou shalt not be named, because you never want to say that something was racist. You always would say there's an unconscious bias. So yes, I am acutely aware that it does exist. But I am proof, as are many of you, because I know I'm not the only one that came from humble beginnings. Many of you did as well. You know all too well the benefits of inclusive leadership because you've lived it. And so when someone said, well, Kimberly, what does that mean? I did a snapshot. So no surprise that CMU is right there on the slide. When I got the Distinguished Alumna Award, it was a proud moment for me. You also see my family, my two sons. So yes, when people have said, Kimberly, can, can you do this and have a career? Absolutely. When they said, Kimberly, how did you become a CPA? So the Reader's Digest version of this story, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about it, is that someone came to my environment when I was in the third grade, and they talked about all the various careers. Now, they weren't talking about technology because we didn't even have a notion of technology. I'm sure Grace Hopper was doing her thing, you know, working on the first computer mainframe environments. But guess what? That was not the reality for a little girl growing up in the inner city of Baltimore. So let me just say we didn't have any of those. My, the TV that we had was click, click, click. And just to give you an indication, there were no remote controls. So for many of you, I know you're horrified right now. We had to take the pliers if the knob came off and that's how we turned the TV. We had aluminum foil on the antennas. That's what we were working with. So when I say someone came to my school and talked about various careers, they talked about being a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, or being a CPA. And when they described being a CPA, it was something that I knew that I wanted to do. And so just imagine, fast forward, I graduated from UMBC. I had a full scholarship because I graduated valedictorian from a high school. It's a whole nother story. Uh, graduated valedictorian, full scholarship, went to Loyola, got an MBA, still wanted to be a CPA. I was working at NASA, got a space flight center, um, overseeing the mainframe data center environment and the help desk, working on some really cool projects for NASA, and still wanted to be a CPA. So I went back to school two years at night. Now, for those of you who have taken a class that is one day a week, you need courage, <laughs> you need fortitude, you need conviction that that's really what you wanna do because it's not easy. And definitely, if you've taken any business classes at all, you know taking advanced accounting, tax one, tax two, governmental accounting, that definitely isn't easy, especially after you've worked a full day. 
So I say that to say I really wanted to be a CPA. And meanwhile, I had an opportunity to work at Motorola, left Motorola, went to KPMG, and then at KPMG had a great intersection between technology and accounting, went to be a CIO at Prince George's County government. When I left the government, um, well, and maybe while I was there, I just didn't want to be in an environment where I wasn't continuing to grow. There is no opportunity to rest on your laurels. We have to be committed to lifelong learning. Every day, there's something to know. Every day, there's something new on the horizon that as leaders, we have to be paying attention to. So that's when I got involved in the CIO program. And I thought it was just an amazing opportunity of collaboration and to get to know the amazing professors. Um, I can't tell you how many times we would get a book and I'd look down and I'd say, well, is that the professor on the cover of this book? So I was still uh, just as amazed and still just as amazed now at the caliber of the talent that we have, both in fellow students as well as the brand and reputation of CMU. But I say that all to say that when I finish, because I'm committed to lifelong learning, I was a CPA by then, I wanted to continue and continue on with the MSIT program where I met Allison, I'm sure. Um, and it's been just an opportunity for me to continue to grow. So that is the Reader's Digest of my story. Meanwhile, I'm a CPA working on technology and moving up in the CPA profession. So I am managing, I would say, the lanes of technology and transformation and accounting and finance. Accountants speak the language of business. Technologists enable the business discussion. Bringing those two together provides me a unique opportunity to talk about risk and strategy, innovation and transformation, and organizations of all sizes around the world. And as the chairman of the American Institute of CPAs, the world's largest accountancy body, and being the first underrepresented minority to become the chairman, it's the first African American, I can tell you it was a pretty good, big honor and an opportunity to meet people, leaders from all walks of life and getting to know our CEO, Safra Katz from an Oracle. She's amazing. And then, of course, Lindsey Vaughn. That was probably a, a huge highlight. Uh, Lindsey Vaughn and, you know, Stephen Covey, as well as John Elway. And there are so many other people that I haven't even had a chance to mention. But I say that to say, inclusion worked with me in my particular case and i try to pay it forward every chance i get and i always talk about the people aspect and understanding that there's a compliment there's going to be robots but there are also going to be some people element so i want to stop and see if there are any questions um, at this point okay no questions well, I will say that for me, that's the, purple, the, um, the best compliment, the compliment of technology and people working together. And I also know that leaders have to inspire and motivate. And so when it gets hard, when we are wondering if we're going to have jobs, if we're going to work, this project is difficult, was difficult on premise, how are you going to do it remote? Leaders have to remember that they have responsibility. We have a responsibility. And so I kept myself motivated because I failed the CPA exam the first time. And so it's usually when you fail, I think, when you learn the most about yourself and you learn the most about whether or not you're committed. Because it's easy to have that commitment tested when it's not easy, <laughs> you know, when something is hard and you're, you're dreading it and you're like, oh my gosh, what happened? I think you have to remember. And in this particular case, that's when my mentors, coaches and sponsors really stepped in to help me. And the reason that we have a, I have a picnic table there is because in today's environment, the CPA exam is administered in a testing facility. But back then it was a pretty much mobile operation. So we would be either, some people were in fairgrounds that were converted into testing centers. And in my particular case, 
I had a picnic table that did people you get enough sitting. water? So I just think that this is a great opportunity for questions. And it sounds like someone has one. Yes? Or are we homeschooling? I have. <laughs> Hi, Kimberly. Okay. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, my name is Sean Neil Campbell, and I'm a graduate of Heinz 2015. And I just had a question regarding sort of how are you refilling your tank, right? Because you speak about all of this motivation, this drive, and, you know, wanting to be that change that or impacting that change that you want to see in the world, right? And sometimes I find that that can be exhausting, right? Because while you have noted that we're having candid con conversations about racism, as a black man, mm -hmm. it is a bit challenging to like sort of have to deal with that and coronavirus and making sure my living room is the home office that allows for me to be optimally effective at work, right? So mm -hmm. how are you sort of implementing maybe new strategies or enhancing your existing strategies to better refill your tank? So I think you have to know yourself. Now for me, I as, as extroverted as I appear to be, and I am an extrovert, but over years, over the years, my E has gotten lower. So let's say if I was an E at 50, my E is at 25 right now, right? Because you end up pouring out to your point to so many people and so many different circumstances. Definitely look at my LinkedIn profile. You'll see I'm trying to scale it even more and help more people understand why this is important, especially now. But I like to read. And so sometimes you just have to unplug from the technology. Technology is awesome. We all know that. That's why we're here. But sometimes you do have to unplug and give yourself a moment of just self-care. Think about what refuels you. Now, some people will watch movies and that refuels them. And they're not watching some movie that's a documentary. They're watching mindless fun. Just do something. If it's gardening, garden. If you want to go on a bike and you want to go hiking, do it. If you just want to meditate, just do that. And then I think for me, when I feel like I might could get overwhelmed, I start compartmentalizing and I start putting things with a lock on it. Okay, that's there. Can't do anything about it. I can only do what I can do. I'm not going to overcommit. I'm not going to stretch myself beyond my own bandwidth in order and my own ability to even handle the issue. I think it still comes back to you and knowing what you need. And then at, at a certain point, you have to just know when to cut it off. Don't let yourself get on empty because then it's, it takes so much longer and it's harder for you to fill it back up. And I will say, if we let ourselves get on E, I think in the cases where I've done that when I was studying in school, that's when you get sick. That's when you, you get more susceptible to things around you because we have to sleep. We have to take care of ourselves. We should be doing some level of movement or exercise. And when we don't do that, trust me, that's when what would be ordinarily a little cold becomes like bronchitis. And that's what I learned directly myself um, when I was in college. So that's when I've learned, okay, you can only do but so much. And I'm happy to have that conversation with you more specifically uh, about your circumstance. Just link in with me and then let's have a conversation. Sounds good. Thank you so much. No, absolutely. Can Any other question? Sure. This is Ron. There's a, there's a um, question in the chat that uh, reads, apart from your academic degrees, what do you think made you the leader of your organization? Of the, at Oracle or from the CPA profession? Um, I think either, but let's let's talk about the CPA profession. I, you, I was just open. I mean, I, I'm thinking about what did I do? I have failed the exam. So keep in mind, the reason that I tell people that I was class valedictorian <laughs> is because I, if I had more time, I would paint the picture of someone who was really nerdy, would read books all week in the inner city of Baltimore, come from school, do what I was supposed to do, pretty used to getting good grades. And for those of you who are here on this call, I know you are as well. The first time you get a C, you are like, oh my gosh, the world is about to come to an end. How did this happen? And don't let type A people like us fail at something because then we're, we're just like, I can't believe this actually happened. So that happened to me. 
<laughs> I failed the exam and I was in a fork in the road. At the time that I failed the CPA exam, I was working well, doing great at Motorola, doing, I mean, I love what I did, but I wasn't in an environment that would actually help me get my objectives and my activities aligned. So I had to change roles. I had to get a review course. I had to start listening to everything that people had said that they did. Sometimes when you're really smart, it makes us a little tone deaf. So we don't always listen to everyone else like we should. That was a wake up call for me. And I started listening. And so after I passed it, so I failed it in February, I passed it in November. And I just said, oh, I worked really hard for this. I was studying with a full-time job about 50 hours every week. So imagine doing that for like five and a half months of 50 hours every week doing nothing. I worked so hard to be a CPA, especially because I wasn't the traditional accountant and I've never been the traditional accountant. I've always been the technology centric person. If you look at my career, you would not find where I actually did the traditional accounting always from a technology perspective. So it made me want to be more involved and it made me say, I work really hard for this. I don't wanna squander this. And I wanna tell other people how they can pass the exam because I did it. And so when I got a call from my industry association and I always encourage everyone, join your industry groups, whatever, whether it's your industry, or whether it's a subject that you're really interested in, join. They invited me to come, and that was the Maryland Association of CPAs. So long story short, I ended up getting on the board of the Maryland Association of CPAs, and once I got on the board, they liked my contributions, they liked what I had to say, my point of view. I became the secretary treasurer, the vice chair, the chair, the past chair, served on nominations, investments, all of the um, key financial audit committees, and then had the opportunity to work at the national level, and then got on the board of directors with people from all over the country, and that was the American Institute of CPAs, serving on that board with CEOs of pretty decent sized companies, at least you know a couple hundred million for sure, and then being selected to be the vice chairman then the chairman, then the past chairman. And so I'm just committed. CPA speak the language of business, so I absolutely love it. It's in my spirit. I think about things from a business-centric perspective. I think business first, outcomes, and then how technology can enable. I never start with the technology. And I think that's because being a CPA and taking business classes helped me bridge the both of those together. So that is how and why I got involved in my profession and why I stay, because I think it's just so important. Hey, Kimberly, it's Georgia. There's another question from the chat. Sure. And it's, sure. do you share any recommendations from your reading list for fellow alumni? Oh my gosh. It's, it's interesting because I am still at heart ready to have the conversation about um, finance transformation, what the office of the CFO could be doing, using robotics process automation, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. But Georgette, I find myself more, in more recent days talking more about people, which I've always did from a change management perspective. But now I'm talking about people from inclusive leadership, and I'm talking more about people from diversity, equity, and inclusion perspective. So now when you want to learn something and you want to know it, not just from my own personal experiences, but from an academic perspective. I am listening and looking at Brene Brown. I've read The Speed of Trust by Stephen Covey. I have, of course, I love all the Malcolm Gladwell series. I think there's implications to what we're talking about around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, reading Anti-Racist, White Fragility. Um, so you wanna talk about race, blind spots, the hidden biases of good people, and so I am reading quite a few publications around people because at the end of the day, for me, it's around talent management and how you lead and manage a finite resource that I believe is a competitive advantage inside organizations that we're just not doing enough around. 
because usually people would make this conversation around people fluffy and they would try to say, oh, that's just something anybody can do. Well, if anybody could do it, we'd already be doing it. There is no doubt a bias that has been happening around the entire country and around the world. And so now that we're in this uncomfortable position of having these conversations, I think we're going to get better, but it's going to be definitely a journey on getting there. So I am reading lots of publications and lots of books like that. But at the same time, I have to keep up with all of the emerging technologies because as an adjunct professor, you're, you're talking about interfacing with people who are CIOs. So if you're the professor, and at the end of the day, we're facilitating knowledge and establishing collaborations because these are really smart people. It's the cognitive dissonance of people learning from each other. And I think faculty members help fuel that and add to that discourse. But by and large, you still have to be pretty smart. So I am constantly pushing myself and looking at those case studies as well so that I can be ready to be a resource for the CIOs and the aspiring CIOs that will be in the high certificate program. What other questions can I answer? Because that's the best part. I mean, I could go through this deck, but the best part are the questions. <laughs> uh, there's another question in the chat. Um, it is, what do you think is the weaknesses of Asians in English speaking working environment and how can they learn from you to be leaders in your field? So one size fits one, so I don't wanna generalize, but I do have some Asian colleagues who are my mentees. And so I remember in particular, cause I tend to not give advice unless people ask me. And so this young lady, I heard her grades, amazing. And we were in Washington, Seattle, Washington, amazing. I listened to her story, I was like, oh my gosh, she's a pioneer, she's, she's awesome. But then when I was talking to her, she did not, she, she wasn't as confident. So then I was like trying to dig deeper, like, what is going on? You're amazing. And I just think from a cultural perspective, now she was not born in the U.S., so we're going to handle it two different ways. So we're going to talk about my colleagues who come here, and we're going to talk about the colleagues who are here. So the ones who come here, yes, we are loud. Let me just say it. And that's what I said to her. Yes, we're loud. Yes, we come off a little overly confident. But if you don't figure out, and this is going to exhaust you, I know it because it's not your personality and you want to be your authentic self, but you're about to go in for an interview. Look at me. Look at me. You're amazing. Now look at me in the eye. Shake my hand. Let's practice. I'm going to walk up to you. I want you to smile and look at me in the eye. So we just practice. Sometimes you just need someone that says, okay, what do, you, what do I need to do? Yes, for my amazing Asian colleagues who are just coming here, you're going to have to step a little bit out of your comfort zone. And I think that's an opportunity for growth. And I think as soon as we started having that conversation, she I could see her like growing in the moment just through the practice of someone doing it with her. That's what we should be doing. Now, Asian colleagues who were already here, I get it. You were born here. You're more American than a whole bunch of other people. When I look at things from an inclusion standpoint, I put myself in the shoes of the individuals. And so, because I'm always trying to build a bridge. Wherever you are, I'm going to meet you halfway. So when I understand from the, you know, my Asian colleagues, their challenges, it's the rudeness of people who presume that they're not fourth and fifth generation because they don't look whatever that looks like. So I have great empathy and sympathy for that. And I would just say, you are amazing in your own right. You don't have to prove anything to anyone, but you know, as well as I do, that the biases are not uh, just for black people and African-Americans. There are biases that are across the board. And I think that through interactions and through people getting to know you, that you'll be in a much better position, but don't let people put you in a box. I refuse the box. So when people say things to me about, oh, are you a CPA or you're a technologist? I'm like, what box? 
because there is no box. We can be anything we want to be. And I think we have to be willing to step out of our comfort zones and show people through just interactions with us that we're different. And then very nicely kind of let them know that it is rude to presume all of the model minority stereotypes that we all have often heard. Kimberly, that, I really appreciate all your comments and, and what you're bringing. Um, in my experience working in organizations in IT, and I, I do coach teams and leaders when they're willing, um, I have mm -hmm. found that often the culture of the organization bubbles down from the top. And what's really lacking in my mind is the coaching at that level, at the more senior levels, to, a, to model the behavior of inclusivity, curiosity, their engagement and care um, almost on an interpersonal level, not just talking about product um, deadlines and so on. And um, so I'm, I'm curious, my question, I guess, is in your mind, what role does coaching within organizations play to create that kind of environment? Not nearly enough. I think you're spot on. So hopefully what we're seeing now, which is different than before, and I know for those of us who have felt like your voices have not been heard and you're like, are we finally going to have people listening to us? I think we might be at a point, a tipping point, <laughs> talking about Malcolm Gladwell, where people are willing to listen. I wrote an article for the Journal of Accountancy that said the 12-step plan to combat racism and unconscious bias. And one of the things I said was, well, two things. One, tone at the top is always needed. We have to paint a collective shared value of what this vision could be and why we need to do it. And then two, we need to really check on our middle management. Because in a lot of cases, what we found is that people haven't left the organization. They're leaving that jerk manager because they didn't get it. They didn't have empathy. They didn't understand. I mean, I just heard in another meeting how someone scheduled something on a religious holiday. And then I was thinking to myself, Kimberly, that could have easily been you. I probably have done it because I haven't thought about it. And so that's the kind of bias that we all have. We all have biases. We all can stand to be coached. Because if I didn't have, and I don't, and I'm going to get one, a calendar that showed the major religious holidays, how am I being inclusive if I schedule something, let's say, on a major Jewish holiday or a major you know, Muslim holiday? And not, because I just didn't know. And privilege, in this particular case, my privilege, was not having to know. So when you slice it and dice it a lot of different ways, we all have things that we can work on and we all can get better at. But I will tell you that there is absolute training on leadership, leading people, and managing people that needs to happen. In some cases, because I'm doing a lot more work in this space now, I'm finding that it's just core communication core delegation, core getting people um, clear directions about what it is that you are asking them to do, managing their expectations right up front. It's just the discipline of leadership and managing, you know, management is just not where it needs to be. And I personally feel, and definitely link in, because we could talk about this for days. I feel like when someone gets a promotion, they're like, congratulations, KT. You're in the role, and then they give you the sexual harassment, and they might give you insider trading, they might give you fraud and ethics, and then they tell you don't harass anybody, don't date me, don't ask anyone out, at, you know, that you work with to date, okay, and now we're doing these drive-bys on sense of belongings, it's not enough. It needs to be hands-on, it needs to be specific. And what I've also said in an article is that I've left those trainings and when they were on, in person, a lot of them are now automated. So you know we are multitasking the whole time. We're just hitting hit, you know, we're hitting enter when it's time to go to the next slide. So how much are people really absorbing? But when you go to a conference and they have those trainings, I can tell you I've left either, I'm there with the choir, or I'm sitting next to someone who is thinking, who are those people? 
Like who is the person that would threaten an African-American man in Central Park and say, I'm going to call the police and then do so and say there's an African-American man threatening me. So if we were to see that. Most people do not realize that because they don't use a racially negative word, that they still could be racist and they really still could have racist tendencies that show up at work because we're still human. So you can't say I'm not racist and then don't do any kind of training or learning because I think it takes active training, active learning on a regular basis. Well said. Mm -hmm. There's there's lots of other questions coming in. Sure. Um, uh, I have a question from the chat and it says, how do you convince people that don't feel the value of diversity or multi multiculturalism to enhance the performance of a team? How do I or have I? How do you? So there are so many surveys. So what I have said, and I actually have a Facebook, they videotape me talking about it. So I'll send it back to Ron and Georgette and they can send it to you. But I actually realized as I thought about it, because we were so afraid to say the word racism because it felt like Voldemort, so we didn't say it. And we didn't want it to be a movement because that felt too fluffy, right? It felt like, oh my gosh, this has taken us into non-work stuff. At work, we should only be talking about the work, not realizing that people are bringing themselves to work. So now we have this collision between the heart and the head. And so trying to do one or the other, as I look at what we've done in the past, it hasn't worked. So now when I'm talking about it, I'm going to talk about the heart and the head. I am going to share, and I have been doing this, what it is like to be a Black or African American living in the United States. And this would really follow any underrepresented minority group, not just us, but in this case, it was just a, an example because our houses are on fire. We all need help. We all need to move this ball forward. Every single group. There's not one group that can say, whoo, we're good. Everybody needs help. But in this particular case, Black people and African American people, our houses were on fire. So that's why we're, we're prioritizing this discussion around those examples. But in this particular case, I'm sharing with them what it's like to have a 17-year-old that, to give you a real case in point, so we're getting an apartment because my son is coming to the Dietrich College, which is awesome. He's majoring in information systems, um, which was a nail biter because, you know, there's, you never know if someone's going to get in or not. You remember that, I'm sure, or many of you probably don't, but some of you remember what it felt like when you were nail biting and whether you would get in. And we came to get an apartment like two weeks ago. In the back of my mind, I was still wondering if they were going to rent an apartment to me as a black woman and for my son. Now, here I am, you can Google my name, I'm successful, and in the back of my mind, I was thinking, should I have done this online? Because Kimberly Ellison Taylor doesn't sound like an ethnic name, would they have been more inclined to rent to me? Now, as it turns out, they really, thank God, only cared about credit score and money, and we have both, so that was good, they didn't care about that. But why did I even have to think it? That's the, in case people try to say it's only for people who do bad stuff, it's not. My husband tells the story of how when he went to get his real ID updated, he was in like track clothes because he plays soccer. He put on a suit. Like, where are you going? You're just going to NVA. This was just earlier, I think last year. And he said, no, I've got to put on a full suit so that people would know that I'm a person of business and of stature. And I'm saying last year, but in my mind, I'm thinking it was probably earlier this year in January, which is when the real ID stuff was kicking in and you had to come in for scheduled appointments. So I give those examples, real life every day of pay equity, of the hiring, of the recruiting, of the advancement, of the promotions, of the people across all the groups that are not sitting in senior leadership positions. And then I say, how well do you know your customers? Because if you don't have people that mirror their perspectives, 
how well do you know what their evolving needs and perspectives and, and requirements are? Because you don't have that sitting at the table with you. And then I move it into a head discussion to talk about the business case, disruption, how we have different perspectives that help us look around corners and why it's so important. And then I pull out all the survey data that says companies that have more women or different minorities perform better. So long way to answer your question, but it's a heart and it's a head discussion. I don't think anymore you can do one or the other. You got to do both together. All right, another question from the chat um, says, five to 10 years ago, did you imagine that you could become a leader? And when did you realize that you could become a leader in your field? Oh, wow. Well, four or five or 10 years, I'm, I'm 50. So no, I don't mind saying that. It's probably out there across the whole world. That's the downside of being so public with your life. It's just out there. So I want to say... When I went to college, my parents had always said, you know, just because you're there doesn't mean you have to do it. So I'm sure all of you have had different examples when you stood alone and everyone else wanted to do X and you were like, no, I'm not doing it. So you're already operating as a leader. When I use leader, I mean the little L and the big L. The big L is the C-suite. The little L is all of us. We're all leaders in our own right. And we should think of ourselves as leaders. It's not something you get ready to do. Most people who are leaders have been leading the whole time. Other people rely on you. You, tap, you step up. You take charge. You raise your hand. You're willing to take on new challenges. You're already a leader. It's just how big, how much scope, how much purview of leadership do you want? And so for me, I think I just wanted to be in a place of having influence and having the ability to help others. I've always did a lot of community service. I think it's important to help other people. Um, one of my personal sayings that I have uh, for my own life is to whom much is given, much is required. And so I do a lot of, of work with the homeless. I do a lot of work with kids in schools. I want them to have school supplies. I want them to have toys during the holiday. So there's so many different ways that I can help and that I can be a leader. And I'm not waiting for anyone else to do anything that I can do. And that's what I'm always looking for. What can I personally be accountable for and what can I do? I, most things that we're talking about today, you could just hang a shingle and literally and also figuratively on any one of the social media platforms and give your voice, do a blog. I, I'll come on. You can interview me. You, there are so many people in the CMU network that would be willing to help you share your ideas, share your thoughts. You're all leaders. Just step into your greatness. Wow, that's powerful. <laughs> yes. Any other questions? We do have another question. What are some sure. of the tactics you've used or you've seen work in a business environment that promote inclusiveness? So I really like the employee resource groups. I know you'll hear them called ERGs for short or BRGs, which are the business resource groups. Basically, affinity groups according to different ethnicities, religions, but I also think, and I wrote an article about this as well, it's called Next Level Inclusion. And if you put Kimberly Ellison Taylor and Next Level Inclusion in, it should come up, where I basically said, in addition to those affinity groups, we need those are more vertical. But what I think we could also do that would foster more inclusion is to do them horizontally and to talk about people who like dogs, people who like cats. Let's talk about people who might like to go skiing, people who have other interests, who play chess, whatever it is, because I think when we go like this, that's important because that helps your sense of grounding and belonging. And sometimes it's almost like taking your shoes off when you're around people who are just like you. So we all need that kind of home grounded base sometimes. But I also think that knowing that there are people who are just like you, they just might be another religion, ethnicity, and orientation, that is also helpful. And it helps, I think, push for more networking. Our human nature says you're going to want to be around people that are just like you. 
all of my mentees know, I will tell them, if you speak Spanish, that's awesome and great, but I need you to not only be around Spanish speakers all day. If you speak some Asian language or you're from India, I need you, I need to see the growth. Going to CMU and hanging out with people who are only like you is going to stunt the growth that you are fully capable of doing. Part of your learning process is not just the formal structure of what you get in the classrooms, it's also the interaction and the cognitive dissonance that you get from being around people that challenge your stereotypes, that challenges your biases, and actually, I think, fosters learning that you then take out into the other communities. But because it's our human nature to just want to be around people like us, we have to fight against it. And I think my challenge to all of you is to look at your circle and figure out who's missing and then look for opportunities to, at your personal board of directors, find those perspectives you are missing in your life. You're missing them. You just don't know that you are. And so we have to figure out how to bring, you know, all of those different thoughts and, and perspectives together. Um, can you share how you have worked with your mentors and champions and leverage them to grow in your industry? So back along the questions of what I've seen work, I think because I'm constantly building the bridge. Now, I know that there are people who would say, Kimberly, it's exhausting. Why do I have to do it? Well, if not you, then who? And if not now, when? So I will practice. So mentorship means Let's say if I was, and this is really tough, let's say I had a mentee, and, and sometimes I do micro or nano mentoring right in the moment because they're asking me on the spot, Kimberly, what can I do? This is really tough, but as a sign of how much I care and respect someone, I tell them the truth. And in this particular case, my colleague, and he was younger than me, but I still consider him absolutely my colleague. He was starting his career. He was from... I want to say Nigeria, but his accent was distracting. It was, it was a heavy accent. And that could be the case for anywhere. It could have been someone who's Latino. It could be someone who's Asian. It could be someone who's Indian, whose accent is distracting. So I said to him, you are amazing. Your work will show for itself. But if we working together, I'm willing to help. Don't figure out how to work on your accent you are not going to be selected. You're going to reach a place where the ceiling is going to be hard because they're not going to be able, not because of only unconscious bias, because that could be there, but it's going to be because how do you put someone to be a leader if people can't understand them? And how do you put someone to be a leader in charge of a group of people if they're not able to really feel comfortable with whatever the language is? Now, is that fair? No, but I gave them the best answer because I would much rather have me say that than every year on your performance appraisal and every year when you try to reach for the next level role when no one else is going to tell you because we're such a litigious society that on page 12 of the HR manual, they say, ignore it, ignore it, ignore it. You don't get the role. You don't know why. And it's because we have to figure out how to work on your accent. And he, I was like, oh man, he's never going to speak to me again. He actually thanked me. And I, I appreciated him thanking me because it was hard. I agonized. When he was asking me, I was like, do I tell him or do I just give him, you know how when people ask you, are you okay? And you're not, but you say, I'm fine. I'm fine. Did I do, should I do that? Or should I tell him the truth? And I would like to think that I did him a service by being honest with him and giving him that real feedback. So people know that if I am their mentor, they're getting the truth because I'm not gonna be the one to let you pass by without knowing something that's gonna help you in your career. So yes, those are the kind of things that we do. We're gonna role play, we're gonna practice over and over, even if it's your smile, even if it's your handshake, even if it's your resume, it's looking at the formats, it's the homework you've done. If you need to be there at eight, my mentees, I'm like, you gotta be there at 7.30. Not the earpiece in your ear, not yoga pants on Friday, 
you have to be look the part, be the part. And so, yes, I, I kind of, I'm not going to say it's a little bit of um, probably agony for them, but I'd like to think that over time you're growing. And, and so it just is a matter of perspective, I guess. So amazingly, Kimberly, it is one o'clock and we are out of time. <laughs> and uh, apologies that we didn't get through your, your slide deck, but I think that the, the oh, conversation no. was lively and I think, you know, that this, it was a great discussion. Um, and I appreciate you coming. Thank you very much. Uh, really, really uh, appreciate you coming. And we will send this recording out to, to the people who registered along with the, the slide deck so you can see what else uh, Kimberly had in store for us. And um, appreciate y'all coming. And we will be on the lookout for our next uh, For Alumni by Alumni session. Thank you. Thank you, Ron, for the invitation. I appreciate it. Bye.